Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. An author paints the following picture of Acts chapter 2. It was a hot morning late in the month of May when the day of Pentecost came that year. The Judean sun was already high above the horizon. In the stillness of the mid-morning air, the temple morning service could be heard as it concluded. The blast of silver trumpets, the thunder of worshipers praying in unison, the solitary voice of the reader chanting from Ezekiel and Habakkuk. Throngs of Jewish worshipers crowded the temple courts. Since Pentecost was a pilgrim holiday, many were visiting from other countries throughout the Middle East, Northern Africa, Europe, and Asia. Suddenly, from high overhead, the roar of a violent windstorm was heard. But how could this be? There were no clouds and there was no breeze. The worshipers stood confused, con searching the cloudless sky to find the source of this disturbance. From the lofty vantage point of the temple, flashes of what seemed like swirling bits of fire from one of the nearby houses below caught their attention. The men paused while shouting and pointing toward the house. What could this wind and fire mean? The crowd pushed onward, determined to know the matter. In a few moments, they reached the house and were pounding on the door. Twelve men from inside pushed their way to the street. The twelve immediately began to address a barrage of excited queries from the crowd. But to the astonishment of the crowd, the twelve answered in the various native languages of those within the crowd. This caused an uproar of discussion. These twelve were obviously Galilean, but who had ever heard of an educated Galilean? Many pressed for answers while others began to mock and accuse the men of drunkenness. Peter lifted his hands to quiet the crowd. The crowd fell silent and fixed their gaze upon Peter as he began to speak. Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. As Acts chapter 2 begins, we learn that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. The they harkens back to the record of chapter 1. The they were the twelve apostles and the rest of the hundred and twenty. The one place that they were all located was in the upper room, which we learn about in Acts 1.13. Since Christ had ascended, the apostles had obeyed His words to stay at Jerusalem and to wait for the promise of the Father. With the rest of the hundred and twenty followers of Christ, they had been praying together in the upper room, and they also appointed Matthias as the twelfth apostle of the kingdom. The day of Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks, arrived. The time was fully come and had arrived for the fulfillment of the promise of the Father and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 2 says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. There wasn't an actual wind or moving of air that accompanied the Holy Spirit when He came. Instead, it was just the sound of a mighty rushing wind, and it happened very suddenly. And notice, too, that this wind came from heaven, indicating its origin from God. 
wind normally blows in a horizontal direction, but this sounded like a wind suddenly blowing down from heaven. And this sound of a rushing wind filled all the house where the 120 were sitting. This sound was not a gentle breeze, but a rushing mighty wind indicating the power with which the Spirit was going to work among Israel. Along with this sound, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. After the auditory manifestation of the Spirit's, arri Spirit's arrival came a visual manifestation. The word cloven means to be divided or to distribute. The way I understand this is that the fire-like appearance presented itself in a single form, and then suddenly it parted in this direction and that, so that a portion of it was distributed and rested uh, upon each of those present in the upper room. So it's not that each tongue that uh, sat upon them appeared divided, but that each tongue divided off from one place, and, it each, and each separate tongue looked like fire, but not real fire. These tongue-shaped, flame-like appearances sat upon each of them, as no one was excluded in the upper room. Then Acts 2 verse 4 teaches, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Being filled with the Holy Spirit at that time enabled all 120 people in that upper room to speak in tongues. A tongue-shaped fire sat upon each of them, and then they were able to speak in tongues, or other languages of the world that before had been unknown to them. We know they were known languages because when the crowd of people in Jerusalem that were from all, all over the world came to the house, verse 6 says, every man heard them speak in his own language. The reason that the gift of tongues was given to these Jewish believers by the Spirit was because they were to take the message of salvation at that time, the gospel of the kingdom, beyond Israel to the uttermost part of the earth. God enabled them by the Spirit to speak in the language of any country into which they went to spread the gospel of the kingdom. They did not have to pray for the Holy Spirit to come. They did not have to pray for the ability to speak in other languages, nor did they gradually learn how to speak in tongues or be fluent in another language. Tongues was an instantaneous gift performed in the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ had told his apostles that they would receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And the gift of tongues was a manifestation of the Spirit's power at that time. As these Jewish believers were filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit controlled them. And his power was revealed through them by performing miraculous signs, wonders, and healings, and speaking in tongues. All of this enabled Israel to, to fulfill her great commission to be witnesses of the risen Messiah. After word spread in Jerusalem and a great crowd of people heard about the 120 speaking with other tongues, they came together to the house. These people who were from all over the world marveled how the apostles were speaking to them in their own native tongue. In verses 9 through 11, the Jews at Pentecost from 15 different countries heard the apostles and the rest of the 120 speaking in the languages of their home countries from all of these places. They were amazed and they were in doubt as to its meaning, but others mocked and accused them of being drunk. All of the apostles stood up and were prepared to answer the accusation about the group being drunk. But Peter served as the spokesman for the rest. And this was because he was our Lord's chosen leader of the apostles and the kingdom saints. Christ had told him, Here, Peter, who 
previously in his weakness had denied the Lord three times with oaths and curses. Having now been filled with the Spirit, he becomes lion-like. He becomes a force for God, and he boldly speaks in the power and wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost began by him addressing the crowd, ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem. Later, in verse 22, he says, ye men of Israel. In verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel know. The only Gentiles present at Pentecost were those who were converts to Judaism, called proselytes. And they were proselytes to Judaism, not proselytes to Christianity. Peter's sermon is addressed to the men of Judea, the men of Israel. It is not addressed to Jews and Gentiles in the body of Christ. If God was beginning a new church here with no difference between Jew and Gentile, then why did Peter address his message only to ye men of Israel and ye men of Judea and never once mention the Gentiles. Peter reassured the crowd that the unusual event of hearing them speak in their languages was not the result of them being full of new wine. After all, he told them, it's only 9 a.m. in the morning. The true explanation was that the Spirit of God had been poured out. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, and having been instructed by the risen Savior for 40 days of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, Peter knew exactly what was happening and how and how he and his fellow believers could speak in these foreign languages miraculously. And he boldly asserts in verses 16 and 17, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. In other words, what everyone was seeing was a specific fulfillment of prophecy from Joel about Israel's last days prior to the establishment of the millennial kingdom. According to Joel's prophecy, the signs of Pentecost were to be followed by signs both in heaven and on earth, and the pouring out of the Spirit was to be followed by the pouring out of the wrath of God on this world. But the predicted wrath being poured out upon the world in the tribulation period has not yet come. Instead, it was interrupted and delayed. When Israel stood by what they had done in crucifying their Messiah and would not repent or accept Jesus as their Messiah nationally, God temporarily set Israel aside in unbelief and in grace saved Saul and ushered in the dispensation of grace. But notice that in Peter's message on the day of Pentecost, he proclaimed that Israel's last days had arrived. He did not say that the pouring out of the Spirit was the first days of the church, the body of Christ, but the last days of God's program with Israel. Pentecost was the beginning of something, just not the church. It was the beginning of the last days of Israel's program. Those days which would immediately precede the coming of Christ to judge the world and establish his millennial kingdom. Acts 2, 22 to 24 read, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. The purpose of Peter's sermon at Pentecost was not to preach the death of Christ as the payment for sin that has been paid for all and to trust Christ alone as Savior, as Paul later did. Instead, Peter preached the death and resurrection of Christ to convince the Jews that Jesus Christ was their promised Messiah and their King and the Son of God. 
This was for the purpose of bringing them under the conviction for their guilt as a nation in rejecting Christ and having him crucified. The terms of the gospel of the kingdom were manifold. They had to repent, confess their sins, sell all they had, be water baptized, and they had to believe. And what they had to believe was tied to the identity of Jesus Christ. When Christ asked his disciples, Whom say ye that I am? Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that is what Israel had to believe to be saved. Faith in his name, believing that the Lord Jesus Christ was Israel's promised Messiah and King and the Son of God. This brought life eternal to those who believe. Peter's message at Pentecost is focused on that, and it zeroes in on that, to convince Israel that Jesus is the Christ, their Messiah, the Son of the living God, and to realize that they had crucified their Messiah and King and that they needed to repent of it. Thus, as you go through the message, such as in verses 22 to 24, you see Peter pointing out, that the miracles, the wonders, and the signs that Christ did for the purpose of showing that he's the, their Messiah. He reminds Israel that they were done in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. So many in Israel saw it with their own eyes. They saw his powerful miracles and wonders. They saw his healings. They saw him cast out demons. They saw him raise the dead. And all of this showed Israel and left her without excuse that Jesus of Nazareth is her Messiah, that he is the Son of God. And by the Spirit, Peter fearlessly points his finger straight at the house of Israel present that day, piercing their consciences, accusing them, that even knowing what he had done in their midst, they still took and by wicked hands have crucified and slain their Messiah. Peter confronts his hearers with the truth then that the one whom they had crucified and slain had risen from the dead. That, whom, that he whom they had stooped so low in their wickedness to rid themselves of had come back and had come forth with power from the grave. And I love how Peter puts Christ's resurrection by the Holy Spirit, that it was not possible that death should hold Jesus Christ. He could not remain captive in the grave. He is God Almighty, the author of life, the resurrection, and the life. Christ could not be overcome by death. On the contrary, he came to this world to meet death and meet it face to face, to grapple with it, overcome it, and crush it. Death has been swallowed up in victory, the Apostle Paul says. And in light of Christ's resurrection, Paul taunts death. In 1 Corinthians 15, and I love the taunt. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? It has no sting. It has no victory. Death could not hold Christ. The resurrection, as Peter is presenting it here, proves beyond any doubt that Jesus Christ is Israel's Messiah. And the Son of God. Acts 2, 32 to 33 reads, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. In verses 25 through 35, Peter appealed to the scriptures and the prophecies given by David concerning Israel's Messiah that were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. 
Quoting first from Psalm 1610, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, or Hades, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Peter reasoned that since David was dead and buried and his tomb was with them until that day, David's body obviously did suffer corruption. And since David knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that of his seed he would raise up the Messiah to sit on his throne, David could not have been speaking of himself, but prophetically of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And by the Spirit, Peter applied this prophecy directly to Jesus Christ, stating, He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell or Hades, neither did neither his flesh did see corruption. Then in verses 34 and 35, Peter quoted from Psalm 110, verse 1, where David wrote, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Peter pointed out in verse 34 that David is not ascended into the heavens. Hence it was Jesus Christ who, according to David's prophecy, was raised from the dead, ascended to heaven, and is seated at God's right hand. The crowd of people at the beginning of before Peter started preaching, the crowd of people would ask the apostles regarding the 120 speaking in their languages, what meaneth this? And here Peter gives them the answer. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. The ascended Lord, in other words, was actively demonstrating the fact and truth of his resurrection by the wonders of Pentecost, the pouring out of the Spirit on believers, and their miraculous ability to speak in tongues and languages of other nations. The explanation for the wonders which Peter's hearers now saw and heard on that day was that Christ had died, that Christ has risen from the dead, that Christ ascended into heaven, and that he has sent the Holy Spirit as he promised. Acts 2, 36 to 38 reads, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The climax of the sermon and Peter's main point that he aimed to prove is summed up in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Peter powerfully demonstrated that by Jesus of Nazareth's miracles, wonders, death, resurrection, ascension, and prophecy being fulfilled in him, all these things declare that Jesus is both Lord and Christ, that he is Lord over all, God in flesh, and the Messiah. And that is what Israel needed to believe, to be saved. As a result of Peter's powerful sermon, his hearers were brought under conviction by the Spirit who was actively working that day, and they were under conviction of crucifying their Messiah, King, and God's Son. And they asked Peter and the apostles, What shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38 means exactly what it says. When you rightly divide the word of truth, you don't need to change it at all. Israel needed to repent. What do they need to repent of? Crucifying their Messiah. They needed to be water baptized in the name 
of Jesus Christ, believing that Jesus is the Christ, that He is their Messiah and God. They needed to be baptized for the remission of sins, and then they, like Peter and the apostles, would receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. At Pentecost, water baptism was required for the salvation of their souls, and believers were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins and to receive the Holy Spirit. And that is not how we receive the forgiveness of sins and the Holy Spirit today. Today, under grace, we receive these blessings by faith alone. The moment we trust that Christ died for our sins and rose again, we are forgiven of all of our sins, and the Holy Spirit immediately and eternally indwells us. But at Pentecost, verse 41 says, Then they that gladly received his word, were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Notice how the Holy Spirit inspired those words. The same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Added unto who? Added unto what? There was already a church in existence at Pentecost. Acts 2 does not teach that believers were formed into the church. It says they were added to the church. And a thing must first exist before anything can be added to it. Believers on the day of Pentecost were added to the 120 in the upper room. They were added to the little flock, to the existing kingdom church that had trusted in Jesus Christ as Israel's Messiah and had been water baptized. The Lord addressed that church in Luke 12, 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. At Pentecost, there were added about 3,000 souls to the kingdom church, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved, verse 47 says. So what happened in Acts 2? At Pentecost, the believing remnant of the little flock, the true Israel, was added unto by 3,000 members when they believed Jesus as both Lord and Christ, and they repented of crucifying their Messiah, and they were water baptized. What didn't happen in Acts 2 is that the church, the body of Christ, was formed and began. The body of Christ began later with the salvation of Saul of Tarsus, the chief of sinners, on the road to Damascus. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.